air day. You're going to see my little colic uh, up at the top today. Welcome back to uh, another episode of Wi-Fi Streaming with Ben Miller. Good to see you all. Got the nice little uh, iPhone screen there. Going to use that a little bit today. Got Wi-Fi Explorer in the background. Going to use that today as well. Uh, also have Wireshark open today so we're going to use uh use all three of those wireshark could probably be a little bit bigger here let's take care of that there we go so yeah got lots of uh stuff to look at today good to do a formal introduction as always also i did not send out the word on twitter that i am starting the stream so let me uh do that here. Let's see here. Yeah, so hopefully you all are, uh, you know, I'm sure you've heard this a thousand times, but, uh, oh, forgot to turn on a light. Give me just a moment. Okay, there we go. Now we have a little bit better light. So yeah, welcome. Hopefully you all are staying safe and healthy. Hopefully you all are not too sick of uh, using that, of uh, hearing that from people. Uh, I know I have definitely heard it and said it a lot. Uh, no doubt about it. Let's see here. Streaming now on Twitch. Join twitch.tv slash Ben underscore sniff Wi-Fi. Talking about how Wi-Fi devices connect and the different security options. Okay. There we go. The tweet is sent. So yeah, so um, hopefully y'all are staying safe and healthy and everything like that. Um, give me just some Should get some water to uh, make it so my throat doesn't get uh, uh, too dry here. You know, coughing nowadays is definitely a major issue for people, so... Uh, if if I if my throat does get a little bit too dry, I may have to pause for a moment to uh, go get a beverage of some type. But yeah, so uh, again, welcome back. Hopefully, y'all are staying healthy and good. Um, for those of you that follow along every week, last week I took a little bit of a detour, kind of went through the first chapter of some training material that I'm writing. Uh, so more news on the training material at a later date. Um, I thought the the first chapter went okay. Um, I thought it went fairly well, but definitely uh, a few things that I need to kind of go through in that chapter to to make sure they're uh, humming. And uh, also, I need to uh, go, I, I need to you know make sure that uh, all of the chapters are in a good state. Graphical design is not one of my fortes, but that's something I'm trying to do a little bit with this class is, is make little illustrations and, and such. And um, it's, it's, it's definitely a bit of a challenge for me. So uh, more, more news on that when I have it. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's what last week was. Um, but uh, for those of you that do follow along every week, if you remember two weeks ago, two weeks ago, I talked about Wi-Fi connections. And uh, let's bring that up right now. Ooh. Actually, 
Give me just a moment. Looks like my whiteboard slash PowerPoint is not as ready as I uh, thought it was. Definitely having a rough start to the stream today, starting late and such. There we go. Okay. So yeah, um, let's get that PowerPoint up. Um, so yeah, uh, for those of you that uh, were watching two weeks ago, uh, two weeks ago, I, I went through a little bit about Wi-Fi connections. So, you know, welcome. Today is April 8th. It's uh, 10 a.m. Pacific time or actually about 1015 now uh, Pacific time. And uh, so, yeah, so uh, two weeks ago, I went through a little bit about Wi-Fi connections. And today is kind of going to be part two in talking about connections because uh, what happened a couple of weeks ago was I spent all of the stream it ended up being i think like a 90 minute stream maybe even more uh but i ended up spending all of the stream talking about wi-fi discovery and while discovery is an important thing to be aware of in my it, it, in my opinion it's something that uh occasionally is misunderstood or, or sometimes is overlooked uh by folks who uh, manage wireless networks you know set up wireless networks whatever the case may be um even though discovery is very important, there there are other parts of the Wi-Fi connection that that may be helpful to uh, to to learn about, helpful to understand. And so I do want to kind of finish this up and and kind of do a part two here. Uh, so today we're going to talk about Wi-Fi connections, and we're going to go beyond just discovery. So uh, to quickly recap here, kind of uh, what a Wi-Fi connection looks like um, so, that, so that you have an idea, so that we have some kind of context for what we're talking about. Uh, the first thing that happens in a Wi-Fi connection is that the user of the device is going to have to select an SSID. SSID is the name of the Wi-Fi network. SSID is what gets broadcast through the air. Um, you know, if you go into a Target store, the SSID of Target or so something like Target, Target Guest maybe, uh, would be the SSID. So the user has to select that in some way, shape, or form. Now, the SSID could certainly be saved on your little client device here. Uh, the SSID could be... Um, uh, something where you have to type it out. It could be something where you have to select it. There's there's a number of different ways to select to uh, uh, choose an SSID. Whoops, where did I go there? There we go. Um, so yeah, so but that has to be the first step. Uh, the user has to choose the SSID. Then after the user chooses the uh, SSID, the device is going to have to choose an access point. That access point is going to have to be an access point that is using the chosen SSID. Makes sense, I think. So it's like I go into the device and I say, you know, here's the network I want to connect to. Then the device searches around and finds a wireless access point that is using the SSID that I chose. Um, and, uh, you know, the SSID has to have the uh, correct security protocols. Uh, there may be other uh, kind of technologies that the uh, SSID has to support that the client device is looking for in order for the client to choose a given SSID. So, so it goes a little bit beyond just choosing that name. And, you know, I'll just use the target example beyond just choosing Target guest. Those of you that uh, aren't here in North America, Target is a big department store chain. There's a, there's one a, maybe a half mile or so from my, uh, from my place. And so uh, that, that's why Target comes to mind. Uh, but yeah, so the point here is the user makes the choice of SSID, the device then chooses an AP, and when the device chooses an AP, the device goes through this process called discovery to make its choice. And that's what we looked at two weeks ago. 
we talked about all of the different facets of discovery. The fact that different client devices may have different methods of trying to find what channel the AP is on. The fact that different client devices may have different preferences for which AP they're going to choose. The fact that when different client devices are moving around and need to roam between access points, different devices may have sort of uh, different roaming triggers, if you want to call it that, different roaming protocols that cause the device to roam in different ways. Uh, so yeah, so, so the point is that there's all these different ways that client devices handle discovery. We, we also talked about the protocols, the, the 802.11 frames that are used during discovery. Discovery involves the client device listening for the beacon frame. Discovery involves the client device transmitting out probe requests and, and receiving back probe requests. Uh, so there's all these different things that the client device you know, needs needs to do as part of discovery. And, and we looked at that a little bit a couple weeks ago. I'm going to come back here to the uh, to what happens during connections. I, I Unfortunately, I always lose my whiteboard whenever I uh, kind of leave the whiteboard, but we'll uh, we'll get back to it here a little bit. But but yeah, just to uh, give you the example of choosing the SSID, here's my phone on the screen. Uh, for my phone, if I swipe up from the bottom, this was a, a good tip given to me by uh, Slim Two Nun, Slim, and then the number two, and then N U N, who's uh, one of my favorite, uh, you know, uh, uh, participants in the stream. Sometimes participates in the chat. Uh, he gave me the tip: uh, swipe up on an iPhone to uh, bring up the little control panel, and then just tap and hold. To uh, bring up the uh, the Wi-Fi, there we go. I can turn the Wi-Fi back on here, uh, and I believe it's if I tap and hold. Yep, if I tap and hold on the Wi-Fi, that I can see all of the different Wi-Fi networks that are nearby, and I can choose one of those networks as the network that I want to connect to. Uh, if I don't see the network I'm looking for, I can always go to Wi-Fi settings and get a more full list of networks that I'm trying to reach. If I'm trying to connect to a hidden network, I can always tap other, and then I can type in the name of the network to uh, allow myself to connect to it. So, uh, so yeah, so that's what um, that's what Wi-Fi client devices are, are, or, or sorry, sorry, that's what it's going to look like for that first step where the user is telling the Wi-Fi client device which SSID to choose from. Uh, for sort of the next step. where the client device has to choose an access point, the client device is going to evaluate uh, which access points are available and nearby. And uh, typically signal strength is going to be a big part of that. If you look in the middle of the Wi-Fi Explorer application that I'm showing right now on the screen, hopefully you can see it pretty clearly there. It's the fifth column from the left, the signal column. Uh, the signal column shows me which networks are in the area. In fact, I'll order the signal column from strongest signal to least strongest signal. And uh, signal strength is something that client devices typically will use as part of their evaluation process in choosing an access point as part of the discovery process. Client device will see that there's this uh, access point out here using the SSID of Spectrum Wi-Fi Plus. That was the example that I used a couple of weeks ago. The client device will look at the signal strength, look at the security protocols, look at whatever information the client needs to look at. And then the client device will choose which access point it's going to connect to. Uh, you can, so uh, what you're looking at here is an application called Wi-Fi Explorer uh, or Wi-Fi Explorer Pro. Um, and I'll uh, write that down when we get back to the whiteboard so you kind of have an idea of what that is. Uh, Wi-Fi Explorer Pro just kind of shows you basic information about the access points that are nearby. So it can help you troubleshoot the connection process. It can help you get an idea of whether there are very few access points, whether there are several access points that your device could connect to. Give you an idea of whether there's a strong signal, whether there's not a very strong signal. So you can uh, use the uh, discovery software for that a little bit. Um, but then if you want to really get into the details of, of how the Wi-Fi device is doing discovery, 
you can go into a protocol analyzer and definitely the kind of most prominent the most popular protocol analyzer is wireshark here's a screenshot of wireshark and uh, we were kind of looking at this a little bit to uh, a little bit two weeks ago in wireshark you can see the actual beacon messages if you look kind of towards the center of the screen center column there uh, the column that says info at the top of the screen it is the sixth column over from the left so in the info column it shows beacon frames and uh, if I go down a little bit further might have to go down quite a bit further I'll also see some probing so there's some probe response frames as well probably there is a probe request frame also that uh, triggered the probe response and so you can kind of track specifically what a given client device is doing as part of the discovery process if you capture on the channel of that device and if you uh, use a protocol analyzer to kind of view what is happening there let me let me make this a little bit smaller just so i can show you an example here of uh capturing I, you know i'm not a hunt yeah you know what i'm gonna have to kind of get rid of this look of Wireshark here but yeah if you're a uh, Mac OS user you can use a uh, application called air tool that's what you're looking at right now is air tool air tool just runs up in the upper right hand corner of a Mac I guess you can change where your menu bar is on a Mac so it doesn't have to be the upper right but upper right is I would say the most common place to have air tool and then you can uh, choose a channel that you want to capture on you know all of the different 2.4 and 5 gigahertz channels are available here let me also move my head so that i'm not in the way here whoops didn't want to do that there we go there we go move my head to the other corner so i'm not in the way and so yeah you can choose all the different 2.4 and 5 gigahertz channels big news uh recently in the wi-fi world is that we are going to be getting a number of additional channels in the six gigahertz band and that is especially exciting news uh so so it's big news in two respects one one place where it's big news is it's always big news if we're getting more channels available uh more channels means uh, the ability to set up more access points without running the risk of having significant interference and by having more access points we can have fewer client devices per access point uh, effectively giving each client a little bit more bandwidth so very very exciting to have all these extra channels opened up I think the FCC announced that in late April these extra channels will become legal for for Wi-Fi usage I don't know exactly how quick devices will adopt those channels but if history is any guide I know that uh, Apple devices for example tend to be relatively quick in adopting new channels and and new protocols and such so I, I wouldn't be surprised if in sometime in perhaps even May or June uh, after doing you know whatever the latest software update is on on this mac computer that i use for these streams if we'll be able to see a bunch of channel numbers that go beyond channel number 165 or, or just see a whole nother category uh for uh six gigahertz hopefully you can see the little five gigahertz there right above where that blue bar is that says 36 you can see the 2.4 gigahertz uh hopefully we will have six gigahertz but yeah so getting back to uh the idea of really Kind of getting in depth with discovery the idea is you choose whatever channel uh the client device is attempting to connect with whoops so you choose whatever channel the client device is attempting to connect with you choose the width of the channel um if you have a uh 802.11n wi-fi 4 client the channel width will be 20 or 40 megahertz if you have 802.11 ac which is what I have then you may have 20 40 or 80 megahertz there there's some 802.11 AC devices that also support 160 megahertz channels it's essentially 280 megahertz channels used concurrently by the same devices at the same times 
Um, but uh, you choose the channel width, you choose the channel number, and then you can start capturing. There's this little capture area here in Airtool. By the way, Airtool is completely free. If you do a uh, Google search for Airtool, you might be able to find it. Um, I'll give you. I'll also give you the uh, name of the website. In fact, I can share the website with you here since I'm sharing my screen. The website is just adriangranados.com. So let me show you that here. Yeah, so there we go. Show you Adrian's website here. I think that's about right. And so, yeah, uh, go to the uh, website. Hopefully you can see that there at the top of the screen, adriangranados.com. There it is, adriangranados.com. If you go to more apps and you go to Air Tool, you'll see the download there. And uh, when you download and install Air Tool, it allows you to do what I just showed you there. So yeah, what we looked at two weeks ago was uh, if you do a capture of someone attempting to make a connection, you can view their, uh, you know, kind of their connection attempt. I think this was uh, my client device, if I remember my filters correctly. Yes, I believe this is. So I can see here my client device sending out a little probe request, getting back a little probe response. So that's my client device uh, kind of looking for wireless access points. And then once you see the authentication message, that is the client device choosing an access point. The authentication message is the first message sent after discovery is finished, after a device has uh, chosen its access point. And that's where I want to pick up today. I realize I'm already a half an hour in today, uh, but you know what I want to talk about today is the connection process once an access point ha it has been chosen. Once the client device goes out there and says, yes, this is the access point I want to make my connection with, uh, then what happens there? Uh, and I uh, want to talk about the different uh, options for security, sort of how how security can work with these connections and uh, show you the example here that I captured in Wireshark. This was an example of using WPA2 or WPA3. They, they use the same authentication methods, or at least for the most part they do. Um, and uh, so yeah, so let's uh, take a look at that example. Uh, first, let's get back to the whiteboard here to kind of finish out what I was talking about there. Okay, there we go. So yeah, again, we are talking about connections. And again, step one is the user chooses the SSID. Step two is the client device uh, chooses an AP. And again, this choosing of the AP is done via the discovery process. Uh, just to give you the names of those applications that I was using and such, uh, I was using Wi-Fi Explorer Pro. And I was using Airtool. Both of those two applications, you can look up at adriangranados.com. He's an independent Mac OS developer. And then another application I was using is Wireshark. Wireshark's a relatively popular open source application for networking folks. And uh, Wireshark's very easy to find. I think Wireshark.org is the name of the website there. Now, getting back to the steps though, so my client device has choos chosen an AP. What happens next? Next up is authentication. And authentication is a little bit of a tricky one. Going to go to the uh, next 
sort of screen of my whiteboard here to talk about authentication. And actually, it uh, strikes me that I might have gone through that too fast. I, I realize this is a video that, uh, you know, at least for many of you, that when you're watching it, you can pause the video and such and, and play it back at your own speed. So maybe I don't need to worry that much about um, about going at a slow enough pace for everybody. But, uh, but you know, authentication is what we're talking about next. I'll, for the folks that uh, may be watching live, you know, make sure uh, I'm not going too fast for anybody. But yeah, so authentication is the next step. And when it comes to authentication, when a client device is making its initial connection to a network, authentication is something that has to happen. It's part of the 802.11 standard that authentication must occur. But it's something also that kind of always works and it's something where there is no credential validation. What I mean by that is it's not really an authentication. When you're when, when one of your client devices is making its initial connection to an access point, there is no information being exchanged in the authentication process that might prevent the client device from being able to connect. So if you're doing any type of troubleshooting on Wi-Fi connections, you can kind of ignore the authentication messages if you're troubleshooting an initial connection. If someone's saying, you know, I'm not connected at all, I try to get connected, I can't get connected, typically you don't need to worry too much about the authentication frames about the authentication packets that are being sent and received because with an initial connection there is no credential validation now with a roaming connection okay so that means i'm go i'm already connected to one wireless access point i'm going to move myself over i'm going to roam over to a second wireless access point if I'm going through some type of roaming connection, then you might, and I'll, I'll tell you kind of the scenarios for might, uh, have a credential validated. And it really just depends on whether 802.11R, fast transition, is being used. Eight hundred two point eleven R fast transition is a part of the eight hundred two point eleven standard that allows Wi-Fi client devices to roam seamlessly between access points without having to reauthenticate to a Radius server, without having to reauthenticate to an authentication server. The idea there is it makes the roaming process quicker. It also makes it so there's less stress on your Radius server. I remember when I was working at USC, I had one of the guys run a report for me and we were getting something like over a million uh, radius authentications per day, uh, at least uh, coming from the wireless side of the network. We were getting over a million radius authentications per day on days where we would see less than 60,000 unique wireless client devices. And so what was happening on campus is people's client devices were making their initial connection when uh, the person came onto campus. But then when the person would move around campus, walk around, ride a bike, ride a skateboard, whatever it would be, when the person moved around campus, their client device would just keep on using the exact same authentication credentials, hitting the exact same radius server over and over again. They would walk outdoors, indoors, whatever it is, ride a bike, ride a skateboard again, whatever method of uh, uh, you know movement someone had, their device would just have to keep on sending the same old username and password over and over again to the same radius server on the same wireless network. All of 
you know, all, all of these were access points that were managed by the same group, by the, by the group that I was working with at the time. Um, and so it was just a big waste of authentication server resources. You know, we, we had, I, I think once we uh, instituted 802.11R, the drop was maybe by around, if I'm remembering it correctly, five or 600,000 authentications we lost per day. So we had a superfluous five or 600,000 authentications happening every day uh, because we weren't using 802.11R. Uh, and it also can streamline the experience for the user. Uh, there's less of a likelihood that the user is going to notice a hiccup when his or her client device is moving between access points. Um, I, I never did get a chance to do any testing that I would call sort of scientific testing uh, when I, when I, after the um, after 802.11R was implemented on campus. But from the what I would call kind of anecdotal testing, meaning where I'm doing testing on one or two devices, but I, I just don't have data for a large enough sample to, to be totally confident in the results. But from the small amount of testing that I did, I saw about 100 millisecond savings. Just the typical roam was about 100, 100 milliseconds quicker uh, from one access point to the other when, uh, when using 802.11R compared to when uh, looking at the devices that were not capable of using 802.11R. So faster for the end user, less, uh, you know, less stress on your authentication servers. Uh, 802.11R is something that can really help out with roaming. And if you're using 802.11R, then the authentication frames, the little authentication packets that uh, you might have seen there briefly in Wireshark, those authentication frames will carry authentication information. However, typically it does always work. So it's not something that I typically do a lot of in-depth troubleshooting on. I'll, I'll look to see if it's there, especially if the complaint I'm getting is that mobility is not consistent on the Wi-Fi network, especially if the complaint I'm getting is when people move around they don't get a seamless connection. They, they tend to drop from time to time as they're moving from place to place. Uh, then I will sometimes look inside a Wireshark capture to see if the device is using fast transition, but I typically don't go inside the fast transition frames because fast transition always works. It's, it's not like the user could misconfigure something to cause fast transition to fail. It's like if the device supports fast transition and if the access points support fast transition, then it's going to work. There's, there's, you know, you don't really have to get in depth in that. But, but I still will look to see if the authentication frames have fast transition information in them. And actually, you don't even need to look at the authentication frames. I mean, that's one place you can look, of course. Uh, but another place you can look is also just in the beacon frames. The beacon frames will also give you an indication of whether fast transition is enabled in, a, you know, in a given area. Uh, the, the place you'll see it is with the mobility domain information element. If you see mobility domain inside the beacon, that'll tell you that fast transition is happening. And uh, I'll bring up Wireshark right now to kind of show you all what I'm talking about here a little bit. So let's bring up Wireshark. Let's also move my head so that I'm in an area of Wireshark where there is less importance. There we go. There is my look at Wireshark. And so what I'm talking about here is when a client device connects, you'll see the probing. The probing is part of discovery, which I kind of talked about earlier. And again, the end of discovery is authentication. So when this device goes through authentication, if I look inside the authentication frame and inside these sort of tagged parameters, I'm gonna see a, a very, very large amount of information in here if the authentication frame is being used as part of fast transition. 
in this case, I captured an initial connection, so I see a very small, a very spare authentication frame. You know, my authentication frame, if you look at the length, second column from the right, or that would be that way, I guess, um, second column from your right, you can see in the length column, it's only an 83 byte frame. Just simply the fact that the frame is that small tells me that this is not uh, this is not an authentication. Whoops, sorry about that. That this is not an authentication frame that's being used for um, for fast transition. Also, uh, you know, even if you don't want to get as hardcore as Wireshark is. You can get this information from your scanner tool, from something like Wi-Fi Explorer. Uh, I can look inside here and I get, when I go to advanced details, so I choose a uh, BSS ID. Down below, I look at advanced details. And when I look inside advanced details, notice I do not see mobility domain anywhere. If I saw mobility domain, then that would tell me that this network is using fast transition. If I don't see mobility domain, that means it is not using fast transition. So yeah, so that's what uh, the authentication process looks like. That's, that's kind of the third step when a device is making a connection. Um, and, uh, and so yeah, uh, on to the next step of the connection. There we go. Okay. So I know, you know, I got to keep on rewriting this. I, I really, you know, should have uh, created slides for it. But just real quickly again, step number one was the user entering the SSID. Step number two was the client device. Uh, going through discovery with the uh, beacon and probe messages and sort of choosing an AP. Then step number three uh, is uh, authentication. So this is the client uh, and the access point going through authentication. Again, authentication, there's really not much to it. Uh, the next step after that is the client and the access points going through association. And association is a process where you are not going to see any kind of failures. The association process does not involve the client device having to send any kind of credential to the access point to prove that the client device belongs or anything like that. Uh, but the association process still can be something interesting to look at because a lot of times in the association process, you can find out what does the client device support? Whoops, once the client supports. So I, I, I don't know if that's a necessarily a big topic for today. You know, today we're talking about connections, the topic of what a client supports. That That's more so uh, if, if I'm doing a stream about like client behavior or differences between how different clients behave. So, uh, you know, I don't want to get too in depth into the whole uh, authentication, you know, the differences between different cl client devices and what you'll see in their, in, sorry, not their authentication, but in their association messages. Um, but th that is something to be aware of. That is something to be aware of that you can find out what the client device supports by looking at the little association messages that go back and forth. Key thing to note about this. Once association is finished, that is the equivalent of a wired port connect. So when you plug a wired de network device into a switch port somewhere, the wireless equivalent of that is association. The wireless equivalent of that is all of these four steps that I just talked about. Choosing the SSID, the client device figuring out which access points are using the SSID and therefore which access points the client could connect to. The client device going through authentication, going through association. Usually authentication and association don't 
they aren't, aren't actually going to stop the client from connecting. They don't, you know, sort of mean that much to, to someone who's doing troubleshooting or someone who's trying to design a wireless network. Um, but those are all the steps that happen that kind of give us the equivalent of a wired device just plugging into a switch port somewhere. Okay. So that's kind of where we are. Now, what happens next? What happens after a wired uh, port connect? Key thing to note here is what this gives us is a Mac layer connection but not necessarily Mac layer authentication. Okay. So we have physical connectivity at the Mac layer. Now my client device and my wireless access point can exchange information, can exchange frames with one another with the physical layer communication happening, physical layer being the radio frequency and the strength of the signal and the modulation of radio waves. That's, a, that's another good topic for, a, for another stream is talking about how modulation works, I suppose. Um, so the physical layer connectivity is there. The Mac layer connectivity is there. That's what kind of the authentication and association are doing is giving Mac layer connectivity to the client device and the access point. But in many cases, even though the Mac layer has connectivity, the Mac layer may not be authenticated. And there's two different ways to authenticate the Mac layer. They are called authentication and key management in the Wi-Fi world. The two different methods of authentication and key management, let's call them sort of 5A and 5B, because you know we were just looking at steps one through four. So 5A and 5B, two different options for authentication and key management. One of them is WPA2 or WPA3 personal. WPA2 or WPA3 personal does not require an authentication server. And then there's also WPA2 or WPA3 enterprise. And this is the one that does require an authentication server, a server-based authentication. So the client device is going to sort of do the wireless equivalent of plugging into a switch port. It's going to go through and user configures the SSID, client chooses the AP, client and AP go through authentication, client and AP go through association. All that stuff happening, that's the wireless equivalent of a wired port connect of a computer plugging into a switch port, a host plugging into a switch port. But then after that, in the wireless world, in order to get Mac layer authentication, and that's really what this is all about, is Mac layer authentication, layer two authentication, you know, in the, in the networking world, Mac layer data link layer, that's another way to say it, data link layer authentication. To get Mac layer or data link layer authentication, the client device either has to do WPA2 personal or WPA3 personal or WPA2 or 3 enterprise. So that's kind of the next step that has to happen when a client device makes its connection. Um, as far as uh, some details on those, WPA2 uh, or 3 personal, this is something that is primarily used in residential Wi-Fi. You might also see this perhaps in some small businesses. I've definitely seen a lot of uh, restaurants here in Los Angeles, bars here in Los Angeles that use WPA2 or WPA3 personal for their authentication. Uh, sometimes you might see it on a guest network. I would not say it's particularly common on a guest network, but you might see it on a guest network. WPA2 or 3 personal involves an 8 to 63 character passphrase. 
and the passphrase must match on the client device and on the access point in order for authentication to be successful. Now, two weeks ago, when I decided to do the uh, first stream about connections, the stream where really I only got through the discovery process, what inspired me to do that stream, to, to talk about connections on the stream, was I had a friend who was having issues connecting at home using a WPA2 or WPA3 personal network. He would enter his uh, passphrase on his, I, I think he was using a laptop, enter his passphrase on a laptop. He would get the little hamster wheel spinning for a moment or two. Eventually it would tell him no IP address and he would have no uh, internet connectivity. And, and the IP address is something at a higher layer. It's something I'm going to get to in a, in a moment as far as you know, the connection process. Um, but the bottom line is he was not able to make that WPA2 or WPA3 connection. And that's what kind of triggered this whole talk about uh, connections. But here's a key thing about it, at least from what I have seen. If you're having difficulty connecting to a WPA2 or WPA3 network, or if you're helping someone get connected to a WPA2 or WPA3 personal network, I would say in many cases, the solution is just a power cycle. And I hate to say that because I realize these are computers. These are logical devices. There's always a solution to the problem. There's always a reason for the problem. So I'm sure in reality, maybe my friend's access point had some type of, you know, whatever, buffer overflow issue or some type of bug in the software, in the firmware for the wireless router, or perhaps in uh, my friend's client device, perhaps in my friend's MacBook Pro. Maybe his MacBook Pro had some type of software issue, buffer overflow, this or that. Maybe there was some kind of issue with the driver, and maybe his MacBook Pro was not sending messages correctly to his wireless router, you know, wirelessly. Maybe his MacBook Pro was supposed to send one message, but for some reason, because of some issue with the driver of his MacBook Pro, the MacBook Pro was not sending the correct message to his wireless route. So there's, you know, there, there's, there, I'm sure there's a logical reason for, for why this stuff happens and why a reboot or a power cycle is necessary. But it's just from the troubleshooter's point of view, from you know my point of view as a network engineer or a user's point of view, you know we just want to get the problem solved. We, you know, we're not going to go in there and you know open up the drivers and start to try to code something differently to make it so this uh, buffer problem or whatever it is is no longer an issue. Uh, it's much simpler for us to just power down the laptop, power it back up after 30 seconds or whatever and see if the connection then works. Same thing with the wireless router. Power it down, wait 30 seconds, power it back up, see if it works. So honestly, that that tends to be the, I, I know that's not, you know, the hey, most, science, you know, most uh, technical way to look at things, but typically that's my recommendation if people run into connection issues using WPA2 or WPA3 personal is just try a power cycle. You know, you can always take a look at the passphrase, have someone re-enter the passphrase. Key thing to note uh, about Apple devices is with Apple devices, you may have to forget the network uh, before you can re-enter the passphrase. So it's like if uh, my device fails, if I try to connect with my client device and I'm not able to get connected, um, typically I'm not able to just like tap on the client device a second, uh, tap on the wireless network name a second time and then get re-prompted for the password. Uh, typically with an Apple client device, you're going to have to forget the network, then go back and, and reconnect. And I'll show you what I'm talking about here when it comes to forgetting the network. Let me bring back up my phone here. There's my phone. So I'm still in the Wi-Fi settings here. If I tap on the little information circle, that's all the way to the right-hand side of where it says TDG Press. When I tap on that little information circle, lo and behold, at the top of the screen, 
it says forget this network. So if uh, for whatever reason you can't connect to a WPA2 or a WPA3 personal network, you've already tried power cycling the phone or maybe you don't want to power cycle. Maybe there's, you know, I, I've seen this happen at, actually at, um, uh, at a uh, restaurant that I was at. I wasn't able to connect to the Wi-Fi. I have a feeling the solution, you know, I, I did the whole forget this network, you know, reconnect to the network. It still wasn't working. I have a feeling the solution was that the wireless router needed to be rebooted. But when I talked to the per the employee at the restaurant, uh, they mentioned, look, you know, there's a lot of people in the restaurant. We don't want to disrupt everybody's Wi-Fi connection. I don't know, the restaurant might have had some back office stuff also working off the same wireless router. And so what they told me was, you know, we'll do the power cycling at the end of the night, but we're not going to do it right now while the, you know, while other people might be using the Wi-Fi network. So if you have a situation where you can't do the power cycling, then uh, perhaps you can try forgetting the network and reconnecting. Sometimes that can solve the problem with WPA2 personal uh, or WPA3 personal. Uh, when it comes to WPA2 or WPA3 Enterprise, two or WPA3 Enterprise, uh, those authentications are going to have to go to an authentication server. And so therefore, there's a lot more moving parts. Let me give you a list of the different issues that I have seen with WPA2 or 3 Enterprise. Number one, the user uh, or perhaps, you know, the user's credential uh, is uh, not in the Radius server. R Radius is a uh, popular, it's a, it's a common authentication protocol. Uh, Radius is not a brand of servers. It's an authentication protocol. It stands for Remote Authentication Dial-In User Service. So uh, it's an acronym. Uh, popular Radius servers include uh, Microsoft. Uh, what does Microsoft call it? I believe it's IAS, the Internet and Authentication Server. It, it uh, you know what? Actually, I think that's an old name. I think it's now called uh, NPS, the Network Policy Server. Um, Aruba Networks, Aruba HPE has a popular Radius server that's used with wireless called ClearPass. Uh, I know Cisco has one. I believe Cisco's, um, gosh, was it ACS? I may be uh, uh, outdated uh, with that. It, it it might have a new name nowadays. Uh, the point is that there are a number of Radius servers. Um, yeah, Rich also mentioning shaking the Wi-Fi router. That, that can sometimes uh, help a little bit uh, when it comes to WPA2 or WPA3 personal. Sorry, I missed that note there initially. But yeah, so... The bottom line here is uh, the user just may not be in the radius server. I've seen that happen. Uh, another thing I've seen happen is the uh, user credential is uh, incorrect. You know, the user just uh, inputs their credential incorrectly. Here's one that's uh, a much bigger frustration is when the user credential expires. Oh, that's the worst. Especially if you have to support... Apple devices, I always encourage people, do not have automatic credential expiration if you can. I, I realize that may violate certain, you know, security protocols that your organization has. I would argue that overall, you're probably making the organization less secure by having people kind of change their passwords over and over again and then potentially forgetting their passwords. I mean, that, I, I would say if, if we look at, you know, recent cases of passwords being compromised and the compromised passwords being used to attack different areas of uh, organizations, at least the cases that have gotten well, uh, well publicized, uh, there, there's a far, far higher likelihood of the compromise happening due to a user not knowing their password than there is due to a user having a password that they sort of kept too long and a hacker was able to eventually figure it out. Um, sorry, there we go. Cisco ISE. Yep, I am out of date on the Cisco one. 
Thank you for that, Rich. Much appreciated. Uh, but yeah, so, um, so, you know, that look, that's just my opinion. I, I, I don't, it's not like I work as a security expert or something like that. So take, take that opinion for what it's worth. But this was a real big frustration for us uh, when I was working at USC is the uh, expired credentials. Because then it's like the user can't get connected because the, exp uh, the credentials have expired. And uh, it, it's, it's, you know, especially with Apple devices, it's not that simple to just get the device to let you enter your new credential. The Apple device remembers, hey, this is a credential that works for you. Uh, you could be, you know, you could be the victim of a hack. So the the device doesn't want to let you enter a different credential, you know, for security reasons, because, you know, potentially that's a, a you know, someone could pre present sort of a false authentication portal, a, a false uh, access point, essentially, and uh, trick you into re-entering your credentials and uh, kind of sending those credentials to the hacker. So Apple devices don't let you just easily re-enter your credentials. You have to forget the network, then go back in and and uh, reconfigure the network sort of from scratch. And it was just a real hassle. There, just a lot of time our help desk had to spend over and over again doing the same thing. You know, telling the student or telling the professor or telling the researcher or telling the uh, staff member. You know, okay, here's the process. Tap the little eye on your phone and, you know, tap forget this network and re-enter your, your, you know, enter your new password. Uh, so it was a frustrating one for sure. But yeah, uh, user credential being expired. I've seen that happen. I've also seen a, uh, a uh, passphrase mismatch uh, between access point and radius server. between AP and radius server, or this could be between controller and radius server. So AP slash controller. In order to configure a, uh, a, a WPA2 or WPA3 enterprise network, the access point has to sort of talk to the radius server. So you'll have to configure the access point to tell the access point what the host name or what the IP address is of your radius server. Uh, you'll have to indicate which, uh, on the radius server, you'll have to indicate which types of authentication are allowed. There's a number of different types of radius authentication that are allowed. Number of different types of EAP, extensible authentication protocol that you might have to configure. Uh, and then another thing that you'll have to configure is a passphrase uh, uh, I, I believe it's called a uh, shared secret, if I remember correctly. This shared secret has to match between your access point and your radius server, or between your wireless controller and your radius server. And uh, I've seen cases where the password just doesn't match. Uh, I've seen passwords where the uh, EAP type is not supported or problems where the EAP type is not supported. Uh, obviously, I've, I've seen problems where, um, uh, yeah, I mentioned the user credential being incorrect. I'm trying to remember if there's any other ones that I've seen here uh, with WPA or WPA2 Enterprise. Ah, gotcha. Yeah, I have seen also uh, that failed authentications can cause a lockout. Uh, so th this was at, this was not with the uh, EAP authentication, but this was with our machine authentication. It was the craziest story, actually, uh, that what happened was years ago, I'm going to say like 10 years ago, someone had used MAC address spoofing software and tried to connect to the network and had done something or other and that mac address had gotten blacklisted by the usc it infrastructure so it was it was like we got to stop this uh mac address from doing something from being allowed to do something so the mac address just got totally blacklisted every single packet 
that a device with that MAC address would send to the network, the switches on the network would just immediately drop those packets. The, the device was just totally blacklisted from the network. Uh, and by a crazy coincidence, it was something like 10 or 12 years later, one of the staff members at USC happened to get a brand new Microsoft Surface tablet that used the exact spoofed MAC address. So whatever it was, I forget the exact year, 2008, 2009, some goofball decides to do some, you know, MAC address spoofing. I don't know, maybe it was trying to do some type of hacking. USC security software recognizes it. The decision is made to blacklist this MAC address that, uh, you know, is, is kind of doing suspicious things. So this MAC address is blacklisted, this spoofed MAC address is blacklisted. And then just by a crazy coincidence in, I think it was 2019, someone happens to show up on campus with that MAC address, with that, you know, that real MAC address. Someone's real device happens to have that spoofed MAC address. Um, and so, yeah, so that was another one where uh, there had just been so many failed authentications uh, that that MAC address had been uh, locked out and just wasn't allowed to connect. I'm trying to remember, there may, might be other things that, uh, oh, yeah, another one would be expired certificates, duh. Expired certificates. Uh, or, you know, sometimes you'll see the client reject the ser server certificate, not approve the server certificate. And I don't know, there may be scenarios that, that I'm not remembering. There may be even more scenarios than this. So the bottom line is, if you are using WPA2 or WPA3 Enterprise, and you have to support those users who are trying to get connected and, and get Wi-Fi access via using WPA2 or WPA3 Enterprise, there are a number of little things that could go wrong um, because of that. Because of the fact that there are so many little things that could go wrong, I find it to be useful to really learn the WPA2, WPA3 enterprise authentication process in detail so that I, you know, can hopefully troubleshoot things a little bit more precisely. You know, rather than just throwing stuff against the wall and saying, oh, you know, Let's ask the user to re-enter their credential. Let's, uh, uh, or let's go check the Radius server to see if the user is in the Radius server. Rather than just having to do a bunch of trial and error, I really like sort of knowing how the WPA2, WPA3 enterprise process works so that I can I can hopefully pinpoint things a little bit more, more quickly, Ho hopefully get to the uh, issue more quickly. So... That's one thing I want to go through here is just, you know, kind of the WPA2 or WPA3 enterprise connection process. And uh, so in this scenario, I have my little client device. I'll use my iPhone as an example. I have my little access point. Perhaps my access point is set up to a uh, connected or is managed, I should say, by a controller. And then I have my radius server. Whatever type of radius server that is, uh, Cisco ICE, uh, Aruba ClearPass, Microsoft NPS, whatever it is, um, that's the, uh, I, I have some type of radius server that's doing the authentications. For this process, the first thing that has to happen here is the association. The association is between client device and access point, that's kind of steps one through four. So, so that whole thing I went through earlier, choose the SID, client chooses the AP, authentication, association, that's just one step here. That's just the association. After the association, then the access point is going to ask the client device for its identity. The identity is the username. Okay. Notice, during this whole process, 
the radius server has not been touched yet it's only after the client device sends its identity sends its username to the ap that the ap forwards the identity to the radius server so one troubleshooting thing that i always like to emphasize is if you do a wireless capture of the wpa2 wpa3 enterprise process and you only see this you only see the association and then the identity request if you only i i guess it would be identity request and identity response if you only see the association and the identity request and response then that means there is no connection between ap or controller and radius server something is wrong with the connection between the access point or controller and the radius server if you have a client device that attempts to connect to a wpa2 or wpa3 enterprise network and all you see when you're capturing is the identity request and response because what's happening there in the background is once the ap needs to connect once the ap gets to this stage of communicating the identity to the radius server the radius server isn't there and so that's when this whole process will sort of stop you know if you see you know kind of nothing more If you see nothing more after the identity stuff, that tells you that there's no connection between the controller and the radius server. So then you can look at the configuration on your controller or on your AP, make sure the radius server's host name or IP address is correct, make sure that the shared secret, the little passphrase, matches between AP and radius server or matches between controller and radius server. Uh, you can look at the configuration for the radius server make sure that the radius server uh, is configured with the ap's host name or ip address or the controller's host name or ip address make sure those two can kind of communicate with each other so you can uh you know tell that just by the fact that you only see the identity now to kind of continue the uh the process here so once the ap uh, sends the user's identity to the radius server then the radius server will kind of indicate the type of eap that is being used that type of eap will then get communicated wirelessly from the ap to the client so again we have another place where there could be a potential failure if you see a failure as part of the eap setup so you capture the authentication attempt you see the identity going back and forth you see the username being sent across the wireless channel from the client device to the access point you know the ap is going to forward that username on to the radius server so you see the identity then you see eap messages then you see the whole eap process start up but if you see that it never really gets fully established that's a sign that the type of eap that the client is capable of using is not a match with the type of eap that the radius server is using and just to kind of make that clear the type of eap is not configured on the access point or controller the type of eap is configured on the client device and on the radius server so that's another thing to potentially look for if the eap setup doesn't fully get completed that's a sign that you'll uh, you know that that's a, that's a sign that you got to modify configuration somewhere typically it's going to mean modifying the radius server to support the type of eap that your clients can support but perhaps in some cases it might mean modifying your client configuration 
to make sure that your client supports the type of EAP that, you, that your RADIUS server is supporting. Okay. The next thing that's going to happen after the type of EAP is established, then typically there is going to be a certificate exchange and the goal of the certificate is to send is to set up a tunnel you know to set up an encrypted link between client and radius server so again the certificate's going to go between radius server and controller or radius server and access point and then between access point and client you're going to have this certificate which again is used to set up the tunnel. Key thing to note about the certificate. The certificate is going to be a large frame. Many, many bytes. Okay. So the certificate is going to be a very large frame that's being sent across the wireless link. So again, if you see a failure, If you see a large frame going between, you know, you capture the authentication attempt, you capture the connection attempt between your client device and your X1, you know, you capture on the channel that your AP is using while the client is attempting to connect. You see the association, great, it worked. You see the identity, great, that finished. You see the, uh, the EAP type set up, great, that was set up. You see this large frame, you see this certificate, and then all of a sudden everything stops. That tells you that the client rejected the server's certificate. Client rejected server's certificate. The radius server's certificate. So that's another area where you can kind of pinpoint what the problem is, pinpoint what might have gone wrong. If you see this whole process, you see the association, you see the identity, you see the EAP type, you see the certificate, but then all of a sudden everything fails. All of a sudden you don't proceed beyond the certificate. That tells you that the client may have rejected the server's certificate. Okay. Once the certificate is set up, then you will get sort of the real authentication. The real authentication happens inside a tunnel, happens inside an encrypted link. And that real authentication again will go between client and access point as well. If you see a failure after the real authentication and, and this real authentication, it's going to be a bunch of EAP request and EAP response frames. If you see, see a failure after the real authentication, that means the server rejected the client's credential. And that's the end of the EAP process. After the client's real authentication happens, you'll see a little EAP success message. EAP success. And that little EAP success message tells you that the client has successfully authenticated to the server. Tells you that everything has gone correct for the server. So I want to, you know, go into uh, Wireshark right now. I, I, I'll bring back up that, uh, that, that slide there momentarily. But for now, I want to go into Wireshark. So here's Wireshark. Bringing it up on my screen right now. So here's discovery, the probe requests, the probe responses. 
here's authentication. Two authentication frames, nothing too interesting in either of the authentication frames. Here's association. Again, if you want to learn a little bit about the client, you can look at the association frame. So I can see here, here's the speeds my client supports, the data rates my client supports. Here's the minimum and maximum transmit power my client is supporting. Here's the different channels my client supports. My client supports basically all of the Wi-Fi channels, all, all of the channels uh, in the five gigahertz band are supported by my client device. So I can see some interesting information by looking at the association. But then once the association finishes, this is the stuff that I was talking about. Give me just a minute here, had a little mix up. And I'm not sure. it is that that is not showing up for me okay hopefully it'll show up soon sorry i just wanted to bring back that little uh that little uh, uh whiteboard thing that i was showing you before but yeah so uh after the associations or after the association then it's all the stuff I was talking about before. You see the identity, request and response. Notice the response has my real username. This is the real username I use when connecting to the Spectrum Wi-Fi WPA2, WPA3 enterprise network. If I were to see nothing after this identity, that would tell me that the controller and the radius server or the access point and the radius server can't talk to each other. Could be because of the shared secrets being mismatched, could be because of the IP or host name configurations, IP address or host name configurations on one side or another. Could be because of a firewall issue. Maybe radius traffic somehow got blocked between the, uh, uh, the, the controller and the uh, radius server or the access point and the radius server, whatever it is. But I know if I only see request identity, response identity, and I see nothing else EEP related coming after that, then that tells me. You know, one of the things you can do if you're using Wireshark, you can kind of uh, add your filter. So notice here, I have a filter just showing my client device. I can also say and EEPOL.version. You don't even have to do an equals or anything like that. If you do a filter for epol.version, that shows you the EEP traffic only. So this way I can see the EEP traffic only and I can see, okay, after the request and the response, I did in fact see more EEP traffic coming through here. Let's see, maybe uh, I got lucky and captured someone else in the area who might have failed. Nope, it doesn't look like it. Nobody else tried to connect during the time that I was connecting. So I can't show you a failure where um, you know, to, to kind of analyze what happened there. But yeah, so uh, the fact that I have EAP messages after the request uh, after the request and response, that means that the AP and the radius server can communicate or the controller and the radius server can communicate. I then see the EAP type. Remember, that's the EAP type. I see it's asking for EAP peep. Let's see here. It says request protected EEP. There it is. Sorry, I just completely uh, was missing that. So this tells me that the access point or really the radius server is telling my client, hey, the type of EEP I want to do is EEP peep, is protected EEP, protected extensible authentication protocol. Client responds back and says, okay, I can do EEP peep. If I were to see a failure at this point, so I see the identity, I see the client hello, the request for that type of EEP, the request for EEP, -peep, and then I were to see a failure, that would tell me the client doesn't support EEP peep. Or it would tell me the, you know, it would just tell me there's a mismatch between the types of supported EEP between the client and the, uh, um, and the radius server. Then look at the next frame. Look at the second column from the right. 
Look at where it says length. Notice this is a very large frame, 1347 bytes. No notice the stuff before, the stuff after, much, much smaller. 1347, 1347, 1326. Notice source is the access point. Ruckus WI, that's Ruckus Wireless. That's the type of access point. So the source is saying from the access point, but really that means the source is the radius server. So radius server sending a large frame, radius server sending a large frame, radius server sending a large frame. Second from the left is the column that shows the source. What's happening there is the radius server is sending a humongous frame. It's sending a certificate to the client device. So the radius server sends these three large frames to the client. That's the radius server sending its certificate, breaking up its certificate into you know three smaller pieces. The radius server sending that certificate to the client device and then the client device is accepting that certificate, this next sort of large frame, 419 bytes. If you look second column from the right, the client is sending back the session key to the radius server. The client is essentially saying to the radius server, here's the encryption key that we're going to use to encrypt my real authentication. By seeing this process completed, the large frames, the client sending back a somewhat large frame, and then by seeing additional EAP messages coming after, because remember I have this EAPOL version filter, by seeing all that stuff, that tells me that the client did accept the Radius server certificate. One problem that can sometimes happen is sometimes the client device won't accept the radius server certificate. But in this case, it did. And again, the way I can tell that is I see these large frames coming from the radius server, and I see the one semi-large frame coming back from the client, that semi-large frame from the client. That's the session key that's being used to encrypt the real authentication. And then down below, here's the real authentication. This application data here, you don't know, you know, that is the real authentication. That's the real MS Chap version two handshake, uh, Microsoft Challenge handshake authentication protocol. That's MS Chap. That's the real MS Chap version two handshake that's going back and forth between the wireless client device and the radius server. And there you see the success message. So now I know that everything worked okay, at least as far as WPA2 uh, and WPA3 Enterprise. And so now I have a client device that, you know, can, uh, that, that has a layer two connection, that not only does it have a connection via layer two, but it is fully authenticated. That is what I am seeing there. And yeah, let me, uh, bring up here real quickly give me just a moment sorry I uh must be missing what I thought I was looking at here. Sorry about that. Give me just a second. I was, I was going to bring up the, uh, that, uh, you know, the, the summary of what happens with WPA2 and WPA3 Enterprise, but uh, for some reason it's not coming up. But I'll be able to bring it up shortly. So yeah, so um, at least I think I'll be able to bring it up shortly. Doesn't look like the export is as quick as I would hope that it would be. Ah, there we go.
Sorry about the little pause here. Just want to get that brought up. So yeah, there we go. So, uh, you know, hopefully you can kind of see that a little bit. Okay, hopefully that's uh, relatively clear. But yeah, so that's all, all, all the... Um, kind of uh you know the steps that i went through the or that we looked at here in wireshark and i'll bring that over here so we can see it a little bit better in wireshark also bring the length field so you can see that a little bit here and I suppose we don't need the whole thing. There we go. But yeah, hopefully you can uh, kind of see that relatively clearly. The association happens. The identity happens. If we can't reach the server, we won't see anything after the identity. Then the type of EEP, if the client and server don't support the same type of EEP, then you'll see a failure after the little uh, type of EEP and client hello. Then you'll see the certificate. The certificate are the very large frame. So you can look at that length column. Length column is now third from the left. So you see those three large frames all coming from the access point, all coming from the radius server, followed by the semi-large frame coming from the client. That tells you that the client has accepted the server certificate. And then you see the actual authentication. If you see a failure at the end of the actual authentication, that means that the client's credential was rejected. Yeah, and so that's how the uh, that's how the whole EEP process uh, works. That's how the EEP process goes. Now, when it comes, you may remember I kind of snuck this in here a little bit earlier on. The thing that inspired me to do these streams about Wi-Fi connections was a friend calling me, telling me that. He wasn't able to get connected on his WPA2 or WPA3 personal Wi-Fi network at home. And you may remember I said that the error that the friend was getting was no IP address. That, that's what his uh, MacBook Pro, his Mac laptop was telling him was no IP address. His solution ended up being power cycle the wireless router you know he just unplugged the wireless router waited 30 seconds or so plugged it back in and that solved the problem and so what i've gone through so far is sort of the wi-fi standards way of, of how the connection works kind of the wi-fi specific stuff how the wi-fi client device goes through discovery what the wi-fi client device does after discovery it goes through authentication, goes through association, goes through this authentication and key management process, this WPA2 or WPA3 uh, process. But the one part I haven't gone through yet is what happens after the Wi-Fi specific parts. You know, if I go back to just looking at everything that my iPhone was sending and receiving... So my iPhone does its discovery, that ends with the probes, does its authentication and association, that's the equivalent of a wired port connect, sends its identity, the fact that the identity is sent and the EEP process continues going on, that means that the, the access point or the controller can talk to the radius server successfully. I see the type of EEP with the little client hello, the request for a protected EEP and then the client hello. That means that the client and the radius server support the same type of EEP. Then I see the large frames, followed by the semi-large frame from the client. That tells me that the client accepted the radius server's certificate. And then I see kind of the full EEP process, this application data, 
That's the encrypted MS chat version two authentication that my client is doing with my Radius server. When I see the success, that means that my client has been accepted by the Radius server, but there's still stuff that can go wrong. At, at this point, the wire, the, the 802.11 Wi-Fi part of your authentication is finished. It's, it's done. These little key messages, one through four, that's just your AES encryption key being negotiated between your client device and your access point. That's all that is. But there's still some extra stuff that might have to happen, having to do with IP addresses, having to do with VLAN assignments. There's a variety of things that still could have to happen with connections. And so what I'm going to do here, we're, we're already a little bit beyond an hour and a half. That's what I try to keep these streams to is about an hour and a half. What I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap up this stream. So this is the end of the talk about sort of the Wi-Fi specific part of, an, of a connection. But then in a future stream, I'll also talk about sort of other aspects of the connection, other other things that could prevent a client device from having a good connection so that, you know, because I've run into this situation before. If you run into the situation where your client device is using WPA2 or WPA3 Enterprise, you do a wireless capture while the device is attempting to connect. The capture looks good. It, it looks like I was seeing here where you get through the whole process and you get that EAP success message. You get the little key management. So you see all of this stuff happening, but then your user is still saying, hey, I can't get to my network resource. I, I, I'm not getting internet access or, or whatever it is. The user still you know, isn't happy with their Wi-Fi experience. There's a few other things that I've seen that could be affecting your connection that just, they may happen to Wi-Fi devices, but they're not specific to the 802.11 center. And so that's what I'll talk about in part three of, uh, of the talk about connections. So I know turning connections into a three episode thing may be a bit much. What can I say? I, I sometimes bloviate a little bit or deviate from the topics a little bit. Uh, but that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to save that for another session because I don't want to go too long here. I want to try to keep it to the neighborhood of an hour and a half, and we're already 10 minutes past an hour and a half. So that'll be it for me today. Um, thank you for joining. Much appreciated. Uh, if you don't already, please do follow or subscribe. I forget what the exact term is there on uh, Twitch, but definitely very much appreciated if you do uh, follow, if you do subscribe there. Uh, for those of you that... Um, you know, are uh, watching on YouTube or uh, anything like that. Or, or I guess even if you are watching on Twitch, uh, if you want to uh, be in touch with me in other areas, here's kind of uh, the list. You can uh, follow me on Twitter. Ben Miller is my Twitter handle. You can uh, uh, check out my blog. I haven't done a blog post in a few months. I still have a couple uh, in the old drafts folder that I need to clean up a little bit and 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 do those uh, also you can always reach me via email ben underscore miller at icloud.com is uh, the email address uh, uh, that where you can reach me and uh, as always you know 10 a.m pacific time so I, I will see you back next wednesday 10 a.m pacific time i did mention this note on twitter i might as well mention it on the stream here um i did recently have some interviews for uh, some work that would prevent me potentially from being able to stream on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Pacific time. So I'll make sure I keep the weekly stream going, but I might have to change the time. So, uh, you know, if you do uh, subscribe or follow, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that I post like a little short video letting you all know that the time is changing if the time has to change. And uh, if you follow me on Twitter, I'll definitely post on Twitter about uh, any kind of time change. And I'm still trying to get find the you know the time to do a second stream per week. Um, I'm still eyeing up Friday afternoon. Last week, the last two weeks, in fact, I thought I was going to be able to do Friday, uh, but then you know it ended up it ended up actually being the uh, interviews for this um, for this thing that that might kind of change my work schedule a little bit, uh, at least for, you know for 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 some amount of time. Uh, and and so uh, so yeah so. 
The plan again this Friday is to try to get on at 3 p.m. Pacific time. That'd be 6 p.m. Eastern time in the United States. Uh, I believe that is uh, that that would be um, 11 p.m. in the UK, 11 p.m. UK time. Uh, so that uh, that's the Friday night stream that I'm going to try to do, although uh, that's not a sure thing as of yet. Thanks again for joining. I will see you all back here next week on Wednesday or perhaps on Friday. Have a good one. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Social distance. You know, don't stick your dirty fingers in your mouth, etc. Bye-bye.